everyone, welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be talking about how hard CRNA school is. And spoiler alert, it's not the math that's the hardest thing, but we will be going over that later. But first, I wanted to show you something really cool. I got my green badge, so I'm officially a senior, so I feel like I can make this video now because I've gotten through the hardest part of the program, which is the first two years, from what I hear anyway. Green means go in the clinical setting, so if you haven't seen any of my other videos, red badges are first years, yellow badges are second years, and green badges are third years, which means you should be able to do stuff on your own and have more autonomy and things like that. So it's just a really exciting time and it means in my final year, I have a little over 11 months left of school now. All right, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's get right into it. I'm gonna go over the three things that I think make CRNA school very hard. And the first one is just, it's nonstop for three years. So there's just so much, you're learning so much information in a short period of time, you're extremely busy, you always have something to do no matter what day of the week it is between clinical, research, classes, exams, board prep, stuff like that. It's just so busy. So it's completely nonstop. You don't really have time to relax or catch your breath. And as soon as you finish one thing, you're straight on to the second thing. And I find that stressful. A lot of people find it stressful as well that I go to school with. You don't really have time to just chill. And if you do take time to chill, which I do often, then you are really just worried about what you're supposed to be doing. We do pre-planning before clinical. So on a class day, you could have class or an exam from nine to one and then you need to go to the hospital at two and pre-plan, and sometimes that takes a few hours. And then the next day you have clinical from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., and then the next day you have class again and you just repeat this process over and over. And then when you throw call shifts and weekends and stuff like that in there, it just becomes even more hectic. So I'm sure you get the picture here, but it's just really busy and you're learning a huge amount of information in a short period of time. Now, I wouldn't say the information that you're learning is extremely difficult to understand, but it's the sheer volume of the information that makes it so hard and the restriction on your time to try and learn the information. So this is where time management comes into play. It's extremely important to stay organized and manage your time well, because once you get behind, it's nearly impossible to catch back up. Hard thing number two. So high expectations is what I would say is number two. People expect a lot of you when you're an SRNA, whether it be academically, whether it be clinically, you're just expected to do a lot more than we were in nursing school. You're expected to go above and beyond to be prepared for everything. Now I'll start with the grading scale because this goes into high expectations. We have kind of a crazy grading scale here. 93 to 100 is an A, 87 to 92 is a B, and anything below an 87 is a C, but you can't have C's in CRNA school, they're not considered passing, so really you need an 87 to pass. Now I'll admit this grading scale was extremely intimidating to me at first, even probably throughout the whole first year. I wasn't used to a grading scale like this. In my nursing program, our grading scale was actually the same, but we were allowed to have a C. So we could have gotten an 80 and still passed because we would have a C if we had an 80. But in this program, we must have an 87. 87 is really high if you think about it and you're taking a 50 question test, you can't really miss that many or you end up below an 87. And I have gotten below 87 on exams before, I've talked about that before, but your average at the end of the class just has to be above an 87. And if you get an 86.5, they round up to an 87 usually, so really 86.5 is the cutoff point. But thankfully I haven't gotten that low and had that issue, but I have done bad on some tests and was able to bring it back up. But that's just overall stressful when you know that you need an 87 to pass something, much less than 93 to get an A. And on top of that, your expectations are also very high in clinical. You're expected to be extremely prepared even as a student. Obviously as a student, you don't know everything, but your CRNA or whoever you are with will know if you are unprepared. We pre-plan for these clinicals, which means we have the opportunity to research the patient, their history, the case we'll be doing, the anesthesia plan that we'll be doing, all this stuff. So if you go to clinical and can't answer questions and you're unprepared and you just seem like you don't really know what's going on, you're gonna have a lot of trouble. Now, I have been in situations before where I don't know the answer to something and I explain, oh, I forgot, can I look that up? Can I step out and look that up? Or can I look it up on my break? As long as you make an effort, usually it's taken well, but if it's something simple that you're really supposed to know and you just don't know it, that can be an issue. I'm just gonna throw an example out there so you know what I'm talking about. Say you were doing a total knee replacement surgery and you pre-planned on that and everything, and they don't always use regional anesthesia for these surgeries, but a lot of times they do. So you can do an adductor canal box or a spinal. So say you pre-plan for a general anesthetic and you that's all you did. And you go to clinical and they end up doing a spinal and a adductor canal block. 
well, you didn't look those up. So they're not gonna wanna let you help with those blocks when you don't even know what's going on. And oftentimes they'll quiz you in these moments, not in a malicious way, but just to help you learn and see what you know. And if you're on the right track and you get stopped up a little and don't know exactly what the right answer is, but you at least are educated on the subject, usually you'll have a really good experience and you'll be taught something. But if you just absolutely have no idea what's going on, that's when you're gonna run into problems and it's gonna become very stressful for you. And it's happened to everybody before where you just looked up the wrong thing or missed something when you were pre-planning, but that's a stressful time. So I just wanted to mention that because clinical can be stressful and academics can be stressful, both in different ways. Now, speaking of stress, which naturally comes along with CRNA school, Thing number three that I find very stressful is the stress. That's kind of a silly answer, but honestly, the stress encompasses a lot of stuff that makes CRNA school even harder than it already is. So I've talked to a lot of other SRNAs about this and I myself am an SRNA. So I'm just gonna name a few things that I think people find the most stressful during CRNA school. Aside from the academics and the clinical portion, I'm gonna be talking more about personal life stuff. So the restriction on time, number one, is definitely stressful. A lot of times people have moved away from their friends and family and even sometimes their spouse to go to this school. So stressful again. I'm gonna say stressful probably a lot during this. Don't drink every time I say stressful. Stress, 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 so much stress. Not working and the money is a whole nother subject. You're on limited funds, you're not working, you're used to making a good nurse's salary and then you go down to making nothing, which can also affect your family. It's worth it in the end, but during the time being, it's very stressful. You may have student loans, which is stressful in itself because you know you're racking up all this debt to try to go to school. And on top of that, you know you have to finish school because you have these loans and that just leads into a cycle of stress. Families often get frustrated with their family member who's in school because of the lack of time they have to dedicate to them. And that's just kind of a hard situation because I totally understand both sides of the story. And I'm sure the family is prepared for their loved one to go to school, but you're never really prepared for three years of having not a lot of spare time. Now, I'm not gonna say we don't have any spare time because you know that I like my spare time and I do a lot of stuff for me as well but there is a restriction on your spare time. There's not as much as you usually have because you need to spend it studying and doing things like that. You're not able to go on trips like you are used to going on if you're a traveler like me. That's something that really was hard for me in the beginning because we just don't have enough days off to take a big trip. That's why I haven't really been able to travel far away for the past few years and that's been really difficult. And then last but not least, all this stuff leads to burnout. Burnout is stress, basically. You have stress for so long that you just can't keep up anymore and your body and your mind is just over it. I definitely felt burnout the worst this past year, the second year. The first year, I was so motivated. I was on top of everything. I was ahead all the time. I was just like, go, 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 super hyper about everything. It was really great. And then I got to second year and I was the same for a while. And then it just became like so long that I just kind of started losing my motivation. And when you lose your motivation, that is where discipline comes into play. Motivation does not cause success, discipline does, because motivation isn't always there. And if you just function based off motivation, you're probably not gonna be successful because you're not always gonna have that. But what you can always have is discipline, and discipline will keep you going, it'll keep you on your timelines, it'll keep you getting things done. I can't say enough about discipline. Practice it every day, do things that you don't wanna do that you know you have to do, don't procrastinate, and just build up your discipline because it really is a skill that you have to work on all the time and be conscious of. Okay, if you can't tell, discipline is something I'm very passionate about because I think if everybody practiced it, they would just be overall happier in life and they would get a lot more done than they wanna get done. It can help you reach your goals. It's just such an important thing that I think is undervalued. Anyway, back to my burnout. So during the second year, I was just over it for like the past six months. I still did everything I needed to do. I still like stayed on my game, I guess, to an extent. But honestly, like I didn't want to study. I didn't want to pre-plan. I was just feeling really burned out because I had been going so hard for a year, year and a half. And it didn't feel like the third year was getting any closer. And I just felt like the second year was honestly so hard mentally, not really academically or clinically. It wasn't as bad as the first year, but mentally, man, I was just so burned out. So I took some time for me. I tried to do some things I enjoy. And I just waited till this third year got here and I got the screen badge. And honestly, I have like a whole new motivation now because I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And we have 11 months and I think 15 days left and that is not very long, it's gonna totally fly by. So I'm very motivated, very excited, 
very hyper about everything again. I feel like that's a good word to describe myself a lot. We're finishing up our research this month, getting ready to study for boards. We're studying for the C exam, which is our mock boards, and then we'll start actual board prep. So there's just a lot of exciting stuff going on. At the same time, all this stuff is kind of terrifying because it means in 11 months I'll be graduated and on my own as a CRNA. Well, probably more like 13 or 14 months because of credentialing and all that stuff and taking boards. But that is a little bit scary, so I'm really using clinical as an opportunity to take every single thing I can and learn. I'm doing everything I can to prepare to be on my own and really just soaking everything in right now. So it's been great so far this third year. I'm one week in, so ask me again in like three months. All right, now that we've gotten through the three things that I think are the hardest about CRNA school, each thing kind of included a lot of stuff, but three main categories. Um, I know you guys want to see the math that we do because everybody asks about this. Everybody's really concerned about the math. And I'll just tell you right now, it's not very hard math and I'm not great at math. Like I didn't take calculus or anything like that. I took trigonometry and it wasn't easy for me. I struggled in that class. So I'm not like a math whiz. So if I'm saying the math isn't hard, the math truly isn't hard. The hardest math about CRNA school was statistics, which I guess you would consider a math. Some people consider it more of like problem solving, but I thought statistics was the hardest. Um, we, nobody failed it. It wasn't that bad. Our teacher was really great and helpful and you had an opportunity to learn what you needed to do. As long as you practiced it, you could pass. For me, statistics was the hardest. It was research statistics. Blah, blah, can't even say it anymore. But yes, that class is over and I survived. So we're done with that. I'm gonna tell you more about the math that we do every day and in all of our classes, the anesthesia math stuff, cause that's more important and that makes up a bulk of the program. So I'm gonna take you over to my desk back there. I'm gonna show you a couple of problems and they're things that I do basically every day when I'm pre-planning or in the clinical setting. Here's problem number one. I'm gonna read it to you guys and just show you how I do it. If you wanna try to do it along with me, you can, but you might not have all the information you need to do it because I just learned some things that I need for this problem along the way. So your patient weighs 65 kilograms and has a hematocrit of 39. She's going in for an appendectomy. What is allowable blood loss for this patient? And down below that is the equation that we need to do this. I have that memorized. I just wrote it out so you guys can see it. Okay, the first thing that we're gonna do is figure out her estimated blood volume. And we know she's 65 kilograms and she's a female. So females technically have 65 milliliters per kilogram of blood. So when we estimate her blood volume, we're gonna do 65 kilograms times 65, and I need a calculator for that. So I'm gonna whip out my handy phone calculator here. 65 times 65, about four liters. So 4225. Now to get to the actual equation, we start with 4225 times. Now we know that our starting hematocrit was 39. And usually for the end hematocrit, we do 30 if it's not already below that. So 30 divided by 39, and that will equal her allowable blood loss. So I'm just gonna do that really fast in my calculator here. I'm not good with like in my head math unless it's pretty simple, like I can do dosages in my head, but not all of the other crazy stuff. So 39 minus 30 divided by 39. I'm just gonna say it equals, this equals. 0.23, so 4225 times 0.23 equals, let's see here, 971. So her allowable blood loss is about 971. Okay, on to the next question because this is something I really do do every single day too. You have Presidex 200 micrograms in two mLs, which is how it normally comes, and you want it in a concentration of five micrograms per an mL. How would you mix it? Okay, so we're gonna mix this Presidex up, and Presidex usually comes in a vial, 200 micrograms per two mLs, and we're gonna mix it into normal saline, and we want a final concentration of five micrograms per an mL so we can bolus it. So how are we gonna do this? Well, I'm gonna mix it into a 20 cc syringe, and I just need to know how much normal saline and how much Presidex to draw up. So what we're gonna do here is first we're gonna draw up 19 mLs of normal saline into the syringe because we don't wanna draw up a whole 20 because then when we add the Presidex, we'll end up with 21 mLs and we only want 20. And then we're gonna draw up one mL of Presidex, which equals 100 micrograms. So you end up with 100 
micrograms of Presidex in a 20 ml solution, normal saline, which is in the syringe. And that equals five micrograms per an ml, like nor my handwriting. Now, if you wanted to make it 10 micrograms per an ml, the only difference would be you would draw up 18 milliliters of normal saline and you would add two mls of Presidex, which is 200 micrograms, and then you would end up with 10 micrograms per an ml. People mix it differently depending on their preference, but I think you get the point now. So see, that math's not too scary, is it? We are back. What did you think of the math? Comment below and let me know what you think of the math because I don't think it's that bad and I'm sure you guys won't think it's that bad either once you see it. Also comment below and say what you think the hardest thing about CRNA school will be for you because I can probably help ease your fears or tell you about my personal experience with that thing. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you found it helpful and informative. I hope it gave you some more insight into SRNA life and what's stressful and hard about it. I wish that I had heard this stuff before I started CRNA school because I thought the academics, the actual course information that we were learning was gonna be the hardest thing ever. And that wasn't even the hardest thing about school. So I kind of prepared myself mentally backwards from what was actually gonna be difficult and stressful. As always, I wanna say thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate your support. We're over 14,000 subscribers now, which is so crazy to me. And I'll definitely be doing another giveaway when I get to 15,000 subscribers. I try to do one at every kind of milestone. So 15 and 20, I'll do more giveaways. But I'm super excited to have this community that we built here. Everybody's super awesome. I've made a lot of friends through this platform and friends all over the US and even internationally that are nurses or interested in anesthesia and even some people who aren't in nursing at all. So it's just been really great. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, please. And make sure to subscribe so you can see more videos like this. If you're new to my channel, I do nursing videos, anesthesia videos, lifestyle videos, travel videos, any kind of video you can think of. I basically just make videos about whatever I want and whatever I'm interested in and whatever you guys wanna see. I always like to do polls and see what kind of videos you wanna to see too. So again, thank you for watching. I hope you have an amazing week and I will see you next week.